Please welcome our guest, Michael Acton Smith. Thank you. That's a nice little reel right there. Thank you. Get yeah, you fired Jason, up. Jason made that. Where's Jason? Where's there Jason? Thank you, Jason. Jason, good work. <laughs> That's a good reel. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Welcome to USC. Have you been here before? I've never been here. Is I that was, right? Yeah, very is intrigued. So. Right. This is uh, it's uh, a course about called Entrepreneurial Mindset, uh, where we sort of look at uh, you know, the traits, the practices, the techniques of healthy and high-performing mindsets. So you're the perfect guest for this. I love it. You've had some amazing speakers here. I've been very, very impressed. It's, uh, we've had a good run, and it continues, and that's why well, it, it's, it's great to have you here. And where are you based out of? So London originally, but I moved to San Francisco about four years ago. So that's where our headquarters is. But we're expanding our presence here in LA. So we've got most of the Calm LA team, team here tonight, and we think that's going to be uh, one of our big growth areas. Excellent. So. Let's Ooh. talk about that. Let's talk <laughs> about that. Welcome, welcome to everybody. Um, you've got 18 to 22-year-old undergrads, primarily. There are some, some grads in here, um, some of whom are you know, going in the job market. So if you mm. interns and positions, please let us know. But tell us where Calm stands today, just general scope and reach, and what you plan to do in LA. Well, um, Calm today, we saw some of the stats up on the screen. It, it's been an amazing journey. It's about seven years since we kicked it off. And uh, originally, my business partner, Alex, and I, uh, we shared a house in London. And we wanted to set up a business together. And we'd always kick around ideas as we played FIFA on our Xbox. <laughs> and uh, Alex said, oh, there's this domain name that's available, calm.com. Uh, we should try and buy it. I said, yeah, wow, that sounds awesome. What a great brand we could build. I said, how much is it? He said, oh, the guy wants a million dollars for it. <laughs> so I said, that's not going to happen. Um, but we negotiated and we chatted. And over about the space of a year, we got him way, way down on the price. We just thought there was something magical about that name. And uh, we were able to, to eventually buy it for much less. We actually offered him 5% of the company, <laughs> uh, which would be worth about $50 million now. And he, he turned us down. Um, so I think, I think he's kicking himself. Uh, and then uh, before Calm.com, Alex had a, a similar business uh, to Calm called LoginChillOut.com, which wasn't quite as snappy. It wasn't worth a million dollars. But uh, that was the kind of starting point. Long story short, we just felt there was this shift that was going to happen in the world. We felt we were heading towards peak screen, peak social media, anxiety, depression, stress, all these modern... Um, challenges were, were growing and we wanted to build the brand and a kind of solution for that. So that was the initial acorn that we planted. That, uh, it's funny that the, the name and the domain site came first or you had a related business so it sort of didn't come exactly well, first, but you, you knew yeah. you were going to do, you didn't know exactly what you were going to do with it, right, when you bought it? Exactly. Yeah, we didn't know it was going to be meditation. We didn't think we'd be getting into sleep. We just, we felt that was the big North Star. That was the, the top of the mountain we wanted to climb and no idea how we'd get there. That's fascinating. Uh, okay, I want to dive in it because you notice he said we want to solve a problem and everybody starts a business generally to solve a problem or they're already a customer or they know that something's not being met. Quickly, can we just cover sort of your background and growing up? Where'd you grow up? How big of a family? And um, what did your parents do for work? So my dad was a librarian uh, and a teacher. He used to bring all these amazing books home for me and my sister. So that uh, sort of gave me a love of, of books and reading and uh, personal development. Um, I grew up in a little town called Marlow in Buckinghamshire in England. Anyone been to Marlow or heard of it? No. <laughs> it's very small. It's on the River Thames. It's very sleepy uh, and quiet and uh, stress-free. I couldn't wait to get away when I lived there, and now I love going back. Um, a very sort of special place. And then I uh, went to university in Birmingham. I studied geography because I had no idea what I wanted to do. Someone told me it was only about four hours a week. and. Uh, it was the most fun student, so I thought that sounded good. <laughs> then I watched Wall Street, and I thought I wanted to be an investment banker. I thought that sounded like the <laughs> coolest job in the world, kind of snapping my red braces, barking into a phone. I did it for six months and realized it wasn't the most <laughs> fun job in the world. Couldn't wait to get out. Uh, and with a friend of mine, set up an e-commerce site called hotbox.co.uk back in the late 90s, just as the internet was starting to bubble up and take shape. So late 90s, uh, you've done six months at an investment bank, and this is not for me. How many of you have even seen the original Wall Street? <laughs> Gordon Gecko. Uh, Good movie. Yeah. Just, the references, they're so young. You know? <laughs> they're like, we've seen the third remake. <laughs> um, 
And so, uh, so you find out that uh, the financial life, or at least working in financial services for someone else, isn't for you. Um, you had a passion for gaming. Um, tell us about your first startup in gaming. Yes, yeah, so the, the first business, Hotbox, was uh, an e-commerce site, gadgets and toys. But yeah, my passion was games. And around 2004, I wanted to create a business that allowed people to play games, not just against one or two or three or four other people, but using the internet to play with hundreds, thousands, even millions of people around the world. So World of Warcraft was just getting going. These massively multiplayer games sounded so cool. So we created a company called Mind Candy. And we developed a game called Perplex City, which was an online and offline treasure hunt. We buried this treasure in this random location somewhere in the world. And then we released clues across different media, helping people uh, get closer to finding it. We created all these characters, these fake websites. We did skydiving and uh, put messages in newspapers. I mean, it was this amazing multi, um, multimedia complex event a $200,000 prize for the first person that found it, so people got very excited. And uh, yeah, it was one of the most creative things I've ever worked on. A bit like the, the movie The Game with Michael Douglas, if anyone's seen that. So yeah, super creative, but commercially disastrous. <laughs> we burnt through about $10 million of venture capital. And my investors weren't too impressed. So. We're gonna talk about success and failure after we sort of go through calm, because I think that's important to hear is that, you know, here's someone who's had a couple shots, and the next one had tremendous success as well, but not financial success either, right? Mm -hmm. So tell us about, uh, uh, what is it, Moshi, sorry. Moshi Monsters. Mo Mo Moshi Monsters. Everyone sorry. in America says Moshi Monsters, sorry. so Moshi Moshi, tomato, <laughs> tomato. Um, it, so we pivoted uh, from this treasure hunt, which as I say, very creative, but just didn't work commercially. We couldn't get enough people playing it. And I'd, I used to have a Tamagotchi. Uh, anyone remember those? Oh, good. Uh, very popular. Tens of millions of these little Tamagotchis were sold. Before that, there was a guy called Gary Dahl in the 70s that created the lo-fi version of the Tamagotchi, which was called a pet rock. Yeah. Do you remember that one? Yeah. He took a rock, he put little googly eyes on it, he packaged it in this box with some straw, gave it an instruction manual, and he became a multimillionaire. And <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was so cool. Really kind of struck a chord, got lots of PR around it. So Moshi Monsters was kind of an evolution of Tamagotchi and this pet rock. Kids could adopt their own little monster online, play with it, look after it, go on adventures with it. And uh, it really struck a chord. I think um, the art was amazing, the stories, the, the tech that we built behind it. And it grew to about 80 million users all around the world. Eight zero? Eight zero. And Eight zero million users. Wow. And we did books with Penguin. We made a music album with Sony. We had magazines and trading cards and a movie with Universal. That was a, an amazing adventure. And um, we thought we were going to be the next Disney. Um, but that didn't quite transpire. <laughs> so tell us what transpired and what was sort of the, the turning point and what were the causes. And what did you learn from that experience? Well, I think... And over what time period was it, this? So this, um, Moshi was quite a slow burn. Several years, we were kind of building it and tweaking it and shaping it. And I love Malcolm Gladwell and his book, Tipping Point. Um, we hit our tipping point with that business in 2009. So nice steady growth, and then suddenly just a rocket ship. And uh, I wish you know, I knew exactly what their silver bullet was, the single thing. It usually, there isn't usually one thing, there's a few things that coalesce and, and come together, but for whatever reason, it, it just really took off. And kids are incredibly viral. When they find something they love, they just tell everybody. It just, we'd get one sign up in a school, and the next day we'd have 30, and the day after, the whole school. It was really fascinating to, to watch it grow in that manner. And our graphs were just going up and to the right, and we thought it would continue. And I think the really valuable lesson was just because things are doing that doesn't mean they'll do that forever. And the challenging thing about kids' entertainment is that just because you're hot one minute, you won't be the next day. Kids move on to the next thing very quickly. And in the summer of 2012, that happened to us. And our numbers just <laughs> started to, we thought there was a problem with our data, and everything just started to slow down and then implode. So um, yeah, we went from thinking we were going to be the next Disney to having very stressful board meetings to having to lay off hundreds of people, um, and uh, and yeah, that was quite a, a, a painful experience. And where did that leave you, sort of emotionally, career-wise, confidence-wise? <laughs> you know, 
a lot of times we're up here and you've got a very successful founder saying, you know, talking in retrospect, and you're, you're in the middle of your story, but you know, that these created a billion dollar app. And so, you know, you don't want to romanticize how difficult this is. Uh, you had two or three shots before, before Calm. Um, gut wrenching, ton, ton of time. Where were you left at the end of uh, Mashima? Yeah, so as an entrepreneur, you know, we, we, you tie yourself to your business so tightly that if the business is failing, you kind of really feel that very strongly. A lot of my friends and family had invested, had kind of huge pressure from everyone that had, had faith in us. So it was a really scary time letting people go. You know, we'd hired over 200 people and we had over five rounds. We had to make multiple redundancies and I had to get up in front of the whole company and, and uh, kind of... Um, go through that so that was really tough for everyone involved the usual you know sleepless nights um, just massive stress uh, as close to burnout as I've ever been just had headaches all the time um, and just couldn't kind of step away from the the kind of the feeling of just massive failure that this thing I'd built over years and promised so many people that had come on the journey that it hadn't worked so yeah it wasn't it wasn't a very fun time that's kind of the dark the dark side of entrepreneurship <laughs> It's, you know, everyone has to be prepared to go there. I mean, truly the difference between an entrepreneur and a manager is do you have the stomach to endure some of this? Because it's, it is sleepless nights, it's uh, tragedies at work, it's not making payroll, it's laying people off or firing people that, you know, their, their livelihoods and families depend on it. From that place um, and that lower point, was your like mental health and stress level, did that lead you to start looking into meditation or mindfulness? And, you know, when did you, because you weren't always a believer. No, no. <laughs> like a lot of people, I was quite uh, cynical. And Alex, my co-founder, had been meditating since he was a teenager. He kind of really, really got it. And he'd often prod me and say, dude, you know, you're going through a tough time. Why don't you try meditation? And I'd be like, why don't you try fucking off? <laughs> 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 it's the last thing anyone wants to hear when they are stressed. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear here, but a bit late for that. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I was definitely, definitely uh, didn't, didn't get it. And I think it, it had a real kind of um, PR problem. You know, I, I think people associated meditation and mindfulness with sort of the counterculture, with religion, with woo-woo. I, I just didn't think it, it was uh, valuable. But I, I did something um, that I'd never done before during this really stressful period. I went away on a holiday all on my own uh, for a week. And uh, I basically took a ton of books. I read a load of research papers. I properly tried to give this meditation thing a go. And um, this kind of light bulb went on in my head, this real kind of inflection point. And I was like, wow, this isn't weird and woo-woo. This is neuroscience. This is a way of rewiring the human brain. This is enabling us to kind of not get caught up in our thoughts. Um, it's like going to the gym for our brains. Who doesn't want to have you know, a stronger mind? And the benefits are just extraordinary, again, backed by science. Everything from giving you better sleep to improving your relationships to strengthening your immune system. So I went to Alex when I came back and I was like, okay, I kind of get this. This should be a key part of Calm. We need to figure out how we can tell the world about this and bang the drums. And uh, yeah, that was a, a really important <coughs> point. So you were customer zero, basically, ground zero of, of the app. Is that when uh, you sort of fit the mission of the company, the, the, the purpose of the company with the problem that you saw? And so what was the original vision for Calm when you, in this iteration, not the original one, but? Yeah, so as I said at the start, we just loved the name and we just loved the idea of helping people relax. We didn't quite know how we were gonna execute on it. And we recognized that meditation could be a really powerful way of doing that. And we connected with an incredible teacher in Toronto called Tamara Levitt, who is a great writer and narrator, she has this beautiful voice. So she was able to, to create the first sessions and the lessons which people really clicked with. And we were off to the races and people just loved it. And uh, again, it, 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 didn't, it wasn't an immediate success. It still took a few years to kind of um, get to the scale that, that we're nearer now. Sure, she's, uh, she's led me to sleep many times. Actually, wonderful. Yeah, it's a wonderful, calming voice. Yeah, it's fantastic. And so you mentioned you know, some of the the macro factors. When you're looking to start a company or a business, you're, you're looking to solve a problem, but you want to look at what the terrain looks like, right? Not, not, not just the competitive, but like what trends are happening because you don't want to be pushing a rock uphill all the time. You want to get yep. some wind in your back. And so you saw that 
there was just more you know, sort of uh, acceptance and uh, not just acceptance, but just this, this trend towards mental health, this trend towards taking care of your mind like you take care of your body. Um, it, uh, it wasn't just California and Southern California that believed it anymore. Very, very un-British thing probably to, to, to go into this. Um, it's interesting because the, the, there's a paradigm in marketing that says uh, uh, aspirin outsells vitamins, mm -hmm. right? So a pain, when, when someone's going to invest in you, they used to say, I want to see the pain. I, wanna, I don't just want to see the pain or a Band-Aid. I want to see a bloody arm with a tourniquet, that much of a pain to solve. And they'd say, well, look at aspirin. Aspirin solves pain. Vitamins are more, they're nice to have. Did you notice that it went, you know, meditation and mindfulness went from it's nice to have mm -hmm. to truly being a pain point for people in their lives? Yeah, I think this is a really, really good point and connected to this idea about timing, launching something when the market is, is, before the market is quite ready for it. You know, I think there's a great analogy for entrepreneurship is like surfing. Um, you want to be early before the wave arrives, uh, but you don't want to be too late uh, when the wave is already broken. There's, there's a real sweet spot. And I think this is what a lot of entrepreneurs do, but because there's so much capital out there at the moment, it's never been easier to launch a business. You can, you can do it in a moment and raise money and, and use all the tools to get going. But I think the truly successful entrepreneurs and businesses spend quite a bit of time before they actually start doing the research, that hard work, um, sometimes for, for years, trying to figure out if the timing is there. Because timing is more important than, than team. It's, it's more important than how capitalized the business is. So many other elements. Bill Gross talks about this a lot as, as the secret factor. Um, so the key is to get going before that market has broken. And as an entrepreneur, you're always looking for those things that are, are going to wedge society, is going to change its opinion on something. And if you have a business that's riding that wave when that shift happens, my god, it's exactly as you say. It's not like pushing a rock up a hill, which most of entrepreneurship is. It is rolling it down the hill. It's the wind in your sails. People want to work for you. Journalists want to write about it. So I think that's important. So meditation and mindfulness, we spotted uh, pretty early that that was going to be a big thing. And there's other areas, you know, you just, if you do the research, if you keep your eyes open for what is going on in the zeitgeist, you can see this happening. So it happened recently with um, plant-based diets and, you know, Impossible and Beyond Meat. Just a few years ago, that was super weird and niche. Now it's everywhere. It's happening with psychedelics. The idea of, you know, taking acid or MDMA or ketamine to help with mental health was crazy and illegal a few years ago, and now that is about to become a, a huge industry. So yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say that's incredibly uh, important to get that timing right. And you talked about the last business, but this one also catching this wave. Um, what you want is a, a, what they call a viral loop, whereas if somebody signs up, you tell 10 friends and they start signing up without, without spending a lot of money. What, and as a digital app, the beauty of digital or e-commerce is that you see everything, you have more visibility into the analytics and operations of your business than any brick and mortar business probably could ever have. <clears throat> what are the things that you focused on both early stage and now that you really keep attuned to? And if you can explain what um, uh, customer acquisition costs are and long term value. Well, don't it's not all business majors and I just want to make sure everyone understands of, that. Of course, yeah. absolutely. So, um, you know, again, one of the signals to tell you that you've got something great is that you have that organic and that word of mouth in the early days. So we tried to raise money for Calm beyond our seed round, but we had no's, endless no's, um, dozens and dozens of no's. So we had no choice but to try and be profitable. We didn't have cash to do marketing. And we got to about 8 million downloads before spending anything on marketing. And I'm a huge believer in thinking about marketing. It, it's basically um, you, you you want to spend once the bonfire is going rather than trying to spend to, to spark it, if that makes sense, because you can waste a lot of money um, if you haven't quite got product market fit. But once you've got product market fit, then uh, you need that skill set of expert growth folks and user acquisition and performance marketing folks. And we have a world-class team at Calm. So yeah, you basically, you look at the LTV, which is the lifetime value of your customers, and you look at your CAC, which is your customer acquisition cost, and you better make sure your LTV is uh, a lot higher than your CAC. Um, 
the, the ratio that uh, you, you want to try and get to once a business is humming is at least kind of three to one. So for every dollar you put in, you get three dollars uh, back. That gets harder to maintain that relationship as, as the business scales and, and matures. But those are kind of very important metrics we look at. Others for a subscription business like ours, and I absolutely love digital subscription businesses. There are a lot of business models out there, but if you can create your own digital content, so your margin is very high. Uh, if you can have customers that love what you do and pay you and stay month after month, year after year, you've got a, a, a great formula for a successful business. So for subscription, businesses like Spotify and Calm and Netflix, a key metric is retention. So you want to make sure, there's no point acquiring these customers if you lose them after a year. Um, you want to make sure they stay from year one to year two, and then from year two, hopefully, for, for life. And companies like Netflix and Spotify have retention levels extraordinarily high, like 90% plus. Calm isn't quite there yet, but we're spending a lot of time creating the content, creating the experience to, to get that retention number up. So everyone understand that? Makes sense? How much it costs to acquire a customer? How much that customer will spend over her lifetime? Over the lifetime with the, with the business? And then, uh, and then churn. You know, how many people are churning in? Because it's way easier to keep, and it's way more efficient to keep an existing customer than to spend to get a new customer. Um, and so that's just the nature of it. It's, it's not that terribly difficult. You've, you know, there, there are two large players sort of dominating this space. Um, what do you view Calm's competitive advantage to be? Yeah, so we get asked this a lot. You know, heads, there are, I think there's over a thousand mindfulness, meditation, sleep apps in the App Store now. It's an incredibly competitive space, but two have really kind of emerged from the crowd. One is Headspace and, and one is Calm. And Headspace is, is fantastic. You know, they, they started a little earlier than us. Um, they're very good at teaching mindfulness. Andy is, 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 a, is, an, is a monk and uh, their lessons are fantastic. But I think what Calm did, and I think it's very important, um, you know, I, I love this philosophy of, of blue ocean versus red ocean. And the red ocean is when you're competing in a market, you know, like Pepsi v. Coke, where it's, it's hard to expand it. You're fighting over fractions of percentage points of market share. Blue Ocean is saying, you know what? We're going to sail our ship out of this bloody red ocean into a completely new ocean. We're going to define and create our own market. And so what we decided to do was instead of fighting over meditation, we reframed the market as mental fitness. And that is much broader than meditation. So um, mental fitness is its basically the same as physical fitness. 50 years ago, uh, as I said, you know, in the opening video, um, it wasn't really a thing to go to the gym or do Pilates or yoga, and now it's everywhere. Nike's a $130 business. We believe mental fitness will be just as important. We treat our minds with the care and respect we do our bodies, so could we be the Nike of the mind? And so that was how we kind of reframed what we're doing. And then that makes our, uh, you have fewer competitors, <laughs> which is great, and uh, you can kind of um, define and, and grow the market yourself. That may be one of the greatest short pitches there is. We're Nike for the mind. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's, and it's a great way to communicate that to possible investors, partners, and because this market, you could say, well, how big can this get? Well, when you dream even bigger than just we're a meditation app or a sleep aid app, whatever space you want to put that in, yeah. and redefine that space. Another point that, uh, that's important, you know, everybody is in the rush to be first. And sometimes the first stumbles, sometimes the first takes all the shots and falls. Don't be afraid to be second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth. There's market there for you. I mean, we had uh, Paul or Orflo who started Kinko's. And, uh, you know, he did it at this school in Santa, UC Santa Barbara by just looking at lines uh, of people for copies. And what he said is, you know, my, my parents' generation, as soon as they saw one company succeed, they go out and knock it off. You know what I mean? Like, there's always room for a second, third, and fourth. Now, you know, it's a crowded space, and there are two dominant ones, but you should always look around and don't be sort of pushed out by competition necessarily. Or see what is working. I think this is really important. See what's working, and then put your own twist or spin on it, and out execute, you know, in the way that Facebook did MySpace, and there are so many different examples out there. And then find, to, to your other point about, you know, the defining the market. I think storytelling is so important in business. It's a really undervalued um, uh, but very important skill for entrepreneurs. We, when we were telling our story to investors, I don't think we did it very well in the early days. I think they put us in this meditation app box 
And when they ran their numbers and the analysts tried to figure out how big this could be, they were like, okay, meditation, if we squint, this could probably be a billion dollar market totally. You know, that's not big enough for an investor that, that's going to put money into your business. They think of TAM, total addressable market, as they need something much, much bigger. And as soon as we started to reframe the story as, you know, no, we're going to be Nike for the mind. We're going to build a hundred billion dollar business here. This is mental fitness. This is everything from sleep to, you know, relationships to weight loss to whatever it might be. Then it's like the penny drops and, uh, yeah, much, much bigger. Yeah. And sometimes they can't see it until you tell it. And so it's really important that you have a great, compelling story and you can push back. Uh, VCs, you know, they... Many of them think they have all the answers. They've seen it all, and so they'll, they'll put a cap on how big you can be. Um, we had uh, Katie Rodan, who started Proactive. She's a dermatologist. And at the time, the total U.S. market for um, acne products was like $110 million. And so that's what they were gearing towards, mm -hmm. like you said. And then someone told her to flip the tortilla and say, we're not an acne company. We are a skincare company. And that market is way larger, just like you're doing. And, you know, Proactive does more than that $110 million of the total acne market. They do all, you know, like 10 times that per year. Wow. Yeah. So they, they sort of inverted that. I love that. Great Uber did advice. that as well when they were yeah. starting out. You know, they, they were just chauffeured cars. How big can that market be? But when you reframe it and think of um, mobility, transportation, that's a multi-trillion dollar industry. Um, as I say, meditation is a billion dollar industry. Health and wellness is a $4.2 trillion industry. So that's a slightly bigger market to, to go after. And the, the trends are in your favor, fortunately and unfortunately for you, unfortunately for the mental health of a lot of people. But it's it's a great tool. Um, you know, it, it's it's uh, paradoxical in that you know part of our anxiety and stress is being attached to our devices. And here's a device and an app on a device that's saying spend more time on your device. And we'll, but you, you eventually go to sleep and you put it down. <laughs> well, that that irony is not lost on us. And and a lot of um, the the way we think about that is that. These devices, these magical black boxes we carry with us everywhere, they're, they're not the problem. Technology is, is not the issue. It's how we use it that, that matters. They're, they're, they're amazing. They can connect us with people all around the world. We use them for maps, on and on and on. But when we just become dopamine frazzled zombies using them mindlessly, that's when they start to, to harm us and, and reduce the quality of our life. And when you can use these devices mindfully and use them when and how and where you want that benefits you, that changes everything with that relationship. I, it's not an easy challenge, obviously, but, uh, but something that we're all probably struggling to do is how do I use it on my terms and not have it invade all my time or all the things that I need to do. But um, uh, I guess you have to be purpose, purposeful and intentional about that. I want to talk about marketing and then mindset, and then we'll open it up for questions. Marketing, you know, in the beginning, obviously scrappy. Um, you know, you, you had uh, viral content and things that people were really just passing on to their friends, and you grew uh, at a rapid rate. Uh, now, very sophisticated marketing uh, partnerships uh, recently with LeBron James. Mm -hmm. uh, what's, what, how has the marketing plan evolved, and what are the goals for sort of the next two, three years on your marketing? So there's a lot of advice out there about marketing and, and building startups. I think in very, very condensed version is I think there are three phases. One is pre-product market fit, where you need to do stuff that doesn't scale, very scrappy, hustly, do whatever you can to, to get customers. The second phase that most companies are in is, is the performance marketing phase. That's when you're putting in a dollar and trying to get an X multiple dollars out and you have to be very sophisticated about your creativity and, and the spreadsheets um, uh, that that section and then calm is now moving that is still extremely important but then you supplement that with brand marketing so if you think of some of the biggest brands in the world they spend a lot of money on tv and billboards and so much other above the line that you can't really put into a spreadsheet but is needed to grow the brand so those are the, the kind of three areas. One other thing I think that Calm has done really well, that is part of our secret source, is, is PR and communications. Like, you know, Alexia uh, runs our PR and does an incredible job of telling the Calm story and finding angles to get effectively free publicity, to have other people writing and telling the story. It's always much better than someone else does it rather than you forcing an advert down their throats. And so with your brands, whatever you're building, always look for those kind of angles that um, are interesting, the little stories. So we saw some on the screen that we created a, this eight hour movie of sheep grazing in a field, which we had hundreds of articles around the world written about. 
we took the GDPR legislation and thought it was pretty boring, so we turned it into a sleep story and got someone to, to read it and got hundreds of articles for that. So always looking for these, these little angles which are so powerful and then they create these little ripples that, that uh, drive uh, a huge amount of traffic uh, to your business. Okay, so that's the marketing side. You, you, you mentioned that you've raised some money. I think you've done three rounds. There's like a C, an A, and a B. Yep. Uh, the total amount you've raised to date? About 140 million. Okay. And uh, who are some of the investors that are uh, the... So A round companies? was Insight Ventures. Uh, B round was TPG and Lightspeed. And um, yeah, they've been great, uh, great investors. I think one of the things we're very proud of is that the business is is growing very rapidly, but is um, profitable. Uh, not making huge uh, sort of EBITDA profits, but we are above break even, which I think is, is pretty rare. You know, you see a lot of companies in the valley growing incredibly quickly, but burning through hundreds of millions of dollars. And I think the market very recently has shifted uh, to focus much more on uh, profit than uh, top line growth. Uh, especially you know, in Southern California firms, uh, traditionally venture capital in the Bay Area was a little bit more, um, uh, say, l lenient on investing in companies that were scaling but not making money. Southern California, our venture capital community typically likes to see profits sooner. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's changing a little bit as we mature. Um, you know, everyone's in a race to, to, to raise money. Um, and, and Michael mentioned how they raised money after they had sort of proven that the, the, the product was catching on. So you, you think that money is the thing that matters. It's, it helps you scale, but you would rather have a great concept and very little money than a mediocre concept and endless money. And the reason being is if you've got a great concept and not a lot of money, you have to figure it out. You have to really be sort of scrappy and understand it. If you've got endless money, you just throw money at the problem. Yeah, I, I well said. I think there's. I love beautiful constraints. You know, if if someone, if a creative person is given a sheet of paper and told to just create, what the hell do they do? But putting constraints on something, I think, is where the magic comes from. And I think it's the same in business. Yeah, if you have lots of cash, you chase every shiny object, you suddenly do a lot of things quite well. If you're forced uh, to have that discipline of just doing a few things, I think it makes a massive difference. And we've raised a lot of money, but we, we've spent very, very little of it, as I say, which, which we're quite proud of. So, so you've, um, got, you've got a runway. <coughs> I'm not going in order, but I'm thinking about when you released your product, again, for, for students who are thinking of, of launching a, a company or a, a technology. When you put it out there the first time, was it perfect? Nope, definitely Talk not. Talk about <laughs> when you release this into the wild and how, you know, what's the value of getting an MVP or something into the customer's hands? Yeah, I think Reid Hoffman talks about this a little bit. What, what's his quote? Something like, um, if you're not embarrassed about the first version of your product, you've, uh, you've launched um, too late. Yeah, so um, you should be embarrassed. It, it shouldn't be perfect. You know, it's an MVP. It's very scrappy. You're going to learn so much more by putting something out into the wild uh, than you are by just endlessly tweaking, iterating, and polishing and, until it's perfect. So yeah, the first version of Calm was very scrappy. We had a different voice. We had a different logo. So much is different. Um, and over time, it, it, it sharpens and gets better uh, because you listen to your users, you look at the data, and uh, it evolves. <laughs> that, that's the idea. You have to get in the customer's hands because they're going to break it. They're going to tell you what they don't like, what they like. I, I made that mistake. I had a digital company, a video company, and um, you know I had a bunch of people saying, "Let's go, let's go, let's go." And I was like, "Oh, let's tweak this. Let's make it look a little nicer." And it didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't the the linchpin in what happened, but it was a lesson. Just like get it into your customer's hands and let them play around with it because you have to adapt. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I'd say to that when thinking about what kind of business to, to launch is. So many people, so many entrepreneurs just create a, a product. They create just this one thing, I want to make this app. I think the most successful ones usually have this just ridiculously big vision. They, they know they want to tackle some massive market. They want to change something dramatically in the world. And whatever they do first is just one of a thousand steps to, to get there. And I think that's really important because you don't quite know how you're going to get there. You might have to launch multiple different products and tweak and take different routes. But don't put everything into that just one product and that app that you, you bake for years and then discover it doesn't work. I'm smiling because you said like something that I really love to hear is that um, when you're envisioning and, and you have a big vision as a founder, um, you shouldn't have the answers, not all of them. If you would have the answers of every step that you're going to take in order to get there, then you're not dreaming big enough. You're, you, know, you can have 
a laundromat, a business that's been done many times before and know every step of the way, that's fine if you want a lifestyle business, if you want something that's scaled. There's no way, every entrepreneur that sat here said, had I known then what I know now, I would have never started the company, all the things that can come up. And so that's sort of the entrepreneurial mindset, the growth mindset that Varun talked about. It's just like, how do you adapt to change, to setback? There are going to be a ton. How do you regulate emotion? How do you without losing your mind every time something goes wrong. <laughs> Those are the things that matter and actually tie into why something like Calm is so popular. How do you regulate emotion in competitive and high stress environments? Um, so let's talk mindset and then we'll open up to questions from students. Um, do, you have a, do you have a personal philosophy that you've sort of thought about and articulated? In terms of business or life? life. or Yours. Well, that's a big question. <laughs> still, still thinking and, and shaping it. Um, I think my personal philosophy on life is, is similar to the mission of Calm, to, to be happy and healthy, and for everyone around me, colleagues, friends, family, to be happy and healthy as well. I think there's, there's not much more important to life than that. And we get caught, we get sidetracked chasing the wrong things, shiny objects and cars and arrays and whatever, but that all is kind of secondary to, to health and happiness. And so what core values, to, besides health and happiness, what other core values do you try and instill in the culture at Calm? So we have a few. We went through this exercise recently. We have eight kind of uh, principles that, that we think about. Uh, just some of them are um, uh, growth mindset. We love working with people that are always learning and uh, curious about the world and sharpening their saw. Uh, resourceful, doing a lot with a, a little. Uh, teamwork makes the dream work. Kind of quite like that one. Um, humble and hungry. I think when you work with people that combine both those things, there's something very special there. One of my favorites is magic. Uh, I think people sometimes can roll their eyes at that. Not many companies have that. But magic is this kind of ephemeral, special quality of, of products. It, it's hard to define. You can't put it in a spreadsheet. But you kind of know it when you see it. You know, Apple products have magic. Uh, and um, other brands, less so. And I think we try and kind of sprinkle that stardust on, on everything we do at Calm. Yeah, it's uh, the creator of Siri is a friend, uh, his name's Adam Chire. And so when they were building Siri, it was surprise and delight. Mm. They put something in there that people have never seen or they, they don't even know they need or want. Yeah. Uh, so that's a great attribute to have for your products. Um, I, think, I think that's how you can build products that people don't just like, but love. And I think that's ultimately, as entrepreneurs, what we're all trying to do. And I think we've, we're on that path at Calm. There's been a million five-star reviews. People just, there's just this real passion for the product because it genuinely changes your life. And I think if you, any of us in this room that are building something, try and create something that isn't just, you pay me X, I'll give you Y. Create something that really goes, goes deep. And yeah. uh, we're, we're all, you know, life is complicated, but it's, it's also very simple. You know, we're sort of, we're animals. We, we know what we need and we sort of deny it. Uh, all too often. Before, last question, and, uh, and then do you have a mic ready for the students? Um, let's talk success and failure, and I don't mean to label anything because, you know, I think failure is in the eyes of the beholder, and so is success. You've had, you've had you know, a couple ones that didn't work out. What did you learn about yourself, and do you learn more from failure than success, and Where's that fear? When I was their age, I had that fear of failure. They, you know, these guys, high SAT scores, ACT scores, great students. They're used to scoring at the top. Entrepreneurship will humble you mm -hmm. um, in ways that just like that academics won't. So, what do you say about those setbacks and failure? <laughs> Are you afraid of failure? Are you embarrassed of failure? No, I think if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to be very comfortable with screwing up. <laughs> And uh, you're playing at the edges. You know, if, if you're in the middle doing something moribund and dull, who cares? That's not going to be successful. When you're playing at the edges, you're going to strike out way, way more often than you succeed. And you just got to get comfortable with that. And you only need to, to hit it and succeed once for you know, 100 failures uh, for that to matter. Um, so I think good entrepreneurs have that strong uh, resilience and ability to, to bounce back from successes and just dust off and, and keep going. I think if you're scared of that and afraid of, of screwing up and need everything to be perfect, uh, I think it's going to be a very tough road. How many, you know, how many of you would consider yourself 
a perfectionist. That's going to be a really rough road to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> and you've got you to learn to deal with that. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be an entrepreneur. It absolutely doesn't. There's also people you want to blend with on your team, right? So maybe you compliment somebody else and their personality and their talents. Um, but it's something that you're going to want to work with because nothing's ever perfect. It's always messy as an entrepreneur, particularly startups. Um, and perf you know, even launching. As a perfectionist, you're going to say, I, I don't I want to do it until it's perfect, until it's perfect. You know, A good plan today is way better than a, a perfect plan in six months or a year. You just got to get out. Speed to the market is really critical. Absolutely. We, we talk about... Um good, oh, done is better than perfect at yeah. Calm. A lot of startups have that philosophy. Just if it's done, if it's, if it's good enough, some things need to be really polished and incredible, but most things just need to be good and shipped. And then only when it's in the marketplace do you really learn what matters, and then you can polish and tighten over time. Excellent. All right, students, who has questions for Michael? Man. Bring yourself back to the present. Use mindfulness as a tool. You know, it's very hard when you're angry or frustrated, something just blew up in your face. Mm -hmm. How does that how do you have like a trigger that you use to just be like, you know, essentially what Calm provides? How do you do that for yourself? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So I, I didn't used to, and I would just get sucked uh, into the whatever I was feeling at that time and think it was going to be like that forever and create kind of negative spirals. And I think one of the great things about um, that meditation does is that it, when you develop a practice, it enables you to um, respond instead of react. And so many of us will react to things that happen to us in life from our amygdala. You know, someone cuts us off in traffic and we like slam our horn. Someone says something to us and we immediately kind of tense up and come back. When you develop a meditation practice, you have that just fraction of a second more to respond and think. You can still get angry and knock someone out if, the, <laughs> if you think that's the right way to deal with that situation. But that fraction of a second is so valuable and you then are able to make hopefully a better decision and kind of step back from getting caught down the spirals. And yeah, exactly. Breathing is another pretty valuable thing as well. We, we, <laughs> we all breathe, hopefully, um, hundreds of millions of times in our life. And when something, when you're seeing that red mist or angry or super stressed, just stopping and pausing on your breath for a few moments kind of slows down your nervous system, reduces the cortisol and adrenaline, and can allow you to then decide how you want to, to move forward. Hi, um, you were saying how like originally you were pretty skeptical about meditation yourself, and you started calm in a time where the space was growing, but it was still kind of taboo for some people. So how did you overcome, or did you even have the challenge of explaining what meditation, like the science behind it, to people? And then how did you overcome getting like those skeptics to get onto it? Well, I think it, it, I think it helped me coming from a skeptical position to a kind of you know all all in position. So it enabled me to kind of. Um, uh, think the best way to develop it and uh, market it. So the biggest thing was just to make it uh, simple, to make it relatable uh, and accessible, and to kind of strip away a lot of the, the elements and the iconography that people sort of associated with meditation and mindfulness in the past. So having to sit in a certain position, wearing certain clothing, climbing up a mountain in Tibet and, and spending you know, six years there. Again, nothing wrong with that, and a lot of people do that. But for the average person, they didn't really connect with any of that. And so we just wanted to show that it was a completely normal thing to do. And the final thing I'll say on this is meditation is, is amazing. It's, it's an incredibly valuable skill. But the penny still hasn't dropped for a lot of people. When we added sleep to the app, that was a, a huge um, second tipping point for us because Handful of, you know, many people in this room will meditate. Hopefully everyone will sleep. Seven and a half billion people go to sleep every night, so that's a pretty big market. <laughs> and, um, and there's no stigma attached. And, and so what's happened is a lot of people come to calm. The on-ramp is sleep, and then they stay for the meditation. So that's been huge for us. Thank you so much for coming in, Michael. Um, over the past few years, a couple companies in the personal growth sector, uh, such as Humu, have adopted AI to make a more catered experience for their users by sending uh, real-time notifications and nudges. Do you see AI as an avenue for Calm to grow uh, your company and, and how they create a catered experience for the user? Yeah, we've been keeping an eye on a lot of these um, 
AI bots and services that the psychologists and therapists are, are overrun. Um, there's a lot of need. So the idea of creating an AI that is infinitely scalable is, is fascinating on paper. I don't know if anyone has cracked it yet. I don't know if the, the, the AI uh, in the world in 2020 is sophisticated enough to replicate that same uh, human connection you get from, from speaking and, and to someone who is a human. <laughs> um, so I think it may get there, but I still think we're, we're several years away um, from that being viable. I don't know any apps that are trying that that have had breakthrough success. I, I, as I say, I still think it's early days. Just you know, talking about machine learning and AI in general, it's, it's definitely something we're very interested in in Calm. So looking at it from other perspectives, for instance, we have a huge amount of data on what our users do within the app. Can we then create a customized experience um, and give them the right content at the right moment when they need it? I think that's a, a more kind of near-term um, use of ML and a AI. You talked about how the uh, PR of meditation was very woo-woo and not great at first. Um, what's something that you think will be sort of the next thing that has a similar reputation that could see a similar growth pattern as meditation or mental health in general? Yeah, so um, that's the billion dollar question. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of ways to find it. I think marry whatever you are interested in and, and just read a ton, marinate yourself with relevant documentaries. I, when researching something new, I talk about the idea of like splashing around in that area. Chat to anyone you can, go to relevant trade shows, read every magazine, blog post, um, and suddenly the dots start to connect of, of where the opportunities are. But um, to answer the specific question, I, I mentioned it earlier, I think um, uh, what's going on with um, in, in the mental health space with these illegal compounds that have been kind of vil vilified for, for decades and suddenly society is starting to shift and go, hang on a minute, maybe the answer to some of the most biggest mental health problems in the world could be uh, these, these drugs uh, that I mentioned. I think there's absolutely fascinating research going on there at the moment and I'm pretty confident that's going to be a massive area. No companies have gone public in that space yet. There's, there's a few that are kind of bubbling away and probably will over the next year or two and I, I think they will be um, yeah, very exciting areas to keep an eye on. And then just the whole ecosystem that will be built around that. So you can't give someone a high dose of you know, psilocybin, magic mushroom, and then expect them to be healed. Uh, where do they do it? Who's going to build the clinics? Who's going to train the therapists? Who's going to provide the aftercare service? So I think there's some yeah, really exciting stuff happening there that's a commercial opportunity and also good for the world. Um, hello, Michael. Thank you very much for being here tonight. So I have this question, like I'm wondering, besides those mindset or qualities you just mentioned, like being an entrepreneur as in this industry, I would like to know what do you think are some other more specific um, qualities or personalities or even skill sets for people who say want to work in this industry of um, mindfulness? Thank you. Well, I think being mindful would be good, and um, having a meditation practice, uh, leading a healthy life, taking care of the kind of the four pillars, uh, physical uh, fitness, mental fitness, sleep, and, and nutrition. So those are all important. And then marrying that, if you want to be an entrepreneur and work in this space, or even go into a startup, having a growth mindset, being relentless, being ambitious, being driven, um, wanting to work hard, I think uh, all of those uh, are really important attributes. Uh, hi, thank you for speaking today. Um, my question is, how do you get people to pay for things that people would normally assume that they don't need or that they can get for free? For example, do you see a world where anyone would actually pay for something like social media? Hmm. Well, a lot of the pushback we got in the early days of Calm uh, from investors was, you know, what you're doing is crazy. This, you can get free meditation content on YouTube. There's hundreds and hundreds of hours. And our answer to that is that, um, you know, it's, it's very easy to create content, but it's, it's very hard to create really special content that people want to pay for. And uh, it's the same with, you know, endless hours of content on YouTube, but people will pay for, for Netflix because that's very special content. So I think um, 
I think that's how you kind of uh, crack that. Hey, Michael. Uh, so I, I've seen Calm and its ads on like YouTube, uh, Instagram, stuff like that. I just want to know how big do you think social media of a role did it play in terms of you know, you expanding Calm and you know, who are your target audiences when you're, in terms of advertisement? Um, just your thoughts on that. Say it again, sorry, how big social media? Like how, how big of a role did social media have? How big of an impact did it have in terms of you scaling up, like in terms of advertisement? Yeah, that's a really interesting thought. I wonder if Calm would have got to this scale this quickly without social media, and the answer's probably not. I think it's a, a massively important um, accelerant. Uh, so Facebook is this absolutely incredible way <laughs> of reaching people um, at huge scale for, for relatively little money compared to every other advertising form that's gone before. And you know, a big chunk, 60% odd of our marketing spend goes to, to Facebook and Instagram. Um, we're trying to wean ourselves uh, off that, but it's it's still really important. So yes, yeah, so it's it's amazing. Billions of, of people out there that, that you can reach, and uh, I think it's a, a massive part of it. Having one product and not putting everything there, but having the big vision too. And I was wondering how you pitch that, how you frame that, um, without sounding way out there, but also including this one product. Well, so as I mentioned earlier, we kind of got it wrong in the early days where we were framing ourselves more as a, a meditation solution, which people just couldn't see being that big <laughs> a, a potential market. And it was then just spending a lot of time rethinking. And I think uh, that the phrase Nike for the mind has been enormous for us. That, that is an instant like, oh, wow, OK, I kind of get that. So um, it's a bit of a cliche to say, you know, the Uber of X or the the eBay of why or whatever, but um, so try, you know, come up with something creative that works, but is like a shorthand way of people instantly going, oh, you're thinking big, this is massive. Um, so um, yeah, it's, it, and it's different for every single product, but it's important because people are busy. You know, when you're trying to hire someone on your team, trying to get them to open their checkbook and invest in you, um, short, snappy kind of uh, phrases like that go a, a long way. Hey, Michael, thanks for coming in today. Um, so I'm actually interested in how you actually built the product. So like how, how much money did you invest? How long did it take to actually code the app, get it up on the app store? How was your experience? How did you find the right people to do it? Um, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, it was, it was very scrappy uh, and hustly in, in the early days. Uh, I think we used Rentacoder or freelance.com, one of those sites to find our first engineer. Uh, we found a guy in Slovenia called Samo, um, <laughs> who is still with us to this day. <laughs> and we love him. And, and he built the Android app. And um, uh, yeah, it's, that's been incredible. And then, yeah, we've worked with a few other kind of um, uh, engineers through that source. So that's we, the way we did it in the early days before we could afford to, to pay for, for engineers. The design kind of Alex, my co-partner, did, and it was very scrappy and ugly, and it didn't really work. I think the interesting thing is anyone wanting to build an app, it's incredibly easy and, and cheap to create an app and put it in the App Store. Literally can do it for a few thousand dollars. It's incredibly hard, though, to go from there to create something that people want to download, number one. Number two, want to come back to, which is number three, want to open their wallet and pay for, number four, and then want to keep paying for, ret retaining. So. There's close to three million apps in the App Store, and a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction you know, are profitable and successful. And uh, so, yeah, don't just have a dream, a vision of building an app and putting it out there, because that's, um, that's just the tiniest part of the puzzle. Hi, I wanted to know if you'd ever considered a medical application for Calm, because I know there is a growing body of research showing that for stress and pain management, meditation's highly effective in reducing those symptoms. Yes, yeah, this is a very topical issue at the moment. Um, the FDA is, is getting more intrigued about digital health solutions. I think this is going to be a huge growth area over the next few years. How can we use our phones and our computers to, to help improve our health through behavioral health changes and, and everything else? So really hot area. Um, I think FDA is, is still quite tricky and complicated, so you don't necessarily need to go through that route. And we haven't, but we might in the future. Um, we are chatting to 
big healthcare providers, you know, United and Kaiser Permanente and these folks that have hundreds of billions of dollars in, in revenue who are very intrigued. Uh, they're hard to work with, there's a lot of admin involved, but um, they are fascinated to see if they can use uh, digital health solutions to um, reduce their, their downstream costs. So um, yeah, it's an important area. Hi, um, so this is kind of related. Um, I'm just wondering, what are some future goals for Calm, and have you thought about expanding globally? Yes, yes, so we're about 50% US. Um, we have, we have a, a brilliant um, international team, uh, headed up by Mavis, I don't know if she's here tonight, but uh, very small team. They've launched this year in German, French, Portuguese, Spanish, and Korean. We're about to launch in, in Japanese, so big, big international plans. Everyone in the world has a mind. We, we want to reach everyone. And then in terms of um, where we want to go and take the brand, a big initiative this year is B2B. So we have a successful consumer product. Can we sell Calm into workplaces? And again, a few years ago, the idea of the CEO signing off and bringing mindfulness and meditation and yoga into the workplace is weird. And now that's a really hot trend um, and is going to continue to grow. And then working with healthcare providers as well. So we're going to try and birth a unicorn from the belly of our current unicorn and, and create a, a new one with B2B. Um, and then the final thing I'd say is, could a brand like Calm exist beyond digital? Could we create a brand that lives as physical products? Could, could we have Calm tea? Could there be Calm clothing? I love the idea of creating a chain of hotels that are optimized for sleep and relaxation. Um, uh, I also want to buy an island uh, one day. <laughs> uh, my investors don't laugh when I say that, but I um, uh, want to buy an island and create Calm Island, the world's most relaxing resort that's optimized for you know, healthy food and nutrition and yoga. And, and uh, I think um, that could be a lot of fun, but one step at a time. So. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I love the app Calm. Oh, My question you. is, what has been one of the most rewarding experiences you've had in founding an app that's helped millions of people? Are there any particular stories that stick out? Wow. Yes. Yeah, so um, I think you know, having all these five-star reviews in the App Store, as I say, a million of them is amazing. Whenever we're having a challenging day and, and things aren't going well, um, I always open up the app and just read a few random reviews. And it's just the full breadth of, of humanity. It's everything from little kids who couldn't sleep uh, using the app, or kids who are getting bullied at school who use it. Um, we've heard about couples who are on the brink of getting divorced, and then they both started doing the daily calm together, and it reunited their love. Um, people who've given up uh, class A drugs because they developed a meditation practice and transformed their lives people who were on the brink of suicide and had their lives saved. So uh, huge numbers of stories, and, and that definitely um, is a, makes, I think, working on a project like this very special. And, uh, so. Hi. Um, so obviously, Calm has a lot of content, which is amazing. But I sometimes find when I'm on the app, I don't even know where to begin, um, just because there's so much great stuff. I was wondering how you personally incorporate Calm into your everyday life, and maybe some of your favorite content or what you do every day, like kind of your favorite parts about the app. Yeah, it is a bit bewildering. We have an amazing content team, and, and we've just been we're very creative, so we're just adding a lot of new stuff into the app. Um, Nick here is working on a really exciting new project. Courtney runs music. There's just, there's, there's so much there. So I think we need to get better at, at helping guide users and presenting the right content that they want rather than just throwing everything at them. So for me personally, um, I love the daily calm. I think that's such a great way to, to, to meditate. You get something new every day. There's a lesson. There's, there's kind of a story that, that Tamara tells. Uh, at 10 AM every day, our team gather to do the daily calm. And we're also busy. Not everyone manages to do it every day. But I think that's a lovely way of kind of connecting with colleagues and, and starting the day off right. Um, I also love the, the sleep stories, uh, which we've got. Um, you know, Matty McConaughey recorded one, which was very popular. Um, popular more with the ladies than the, the men. Uh, we get a lot of husbands writing to us saying, all my wife wants to do these days is listen to Bloody Matthew. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's quite entertaining. Um, so yeah, sleep is, is uh, uh, one of the areas I love. I just love this idea of turning bedtime into um, something that's entertaining, something interesting. We all loved having stories read to us when we were kids. Why should that stop when we're older? So um, yeah, those are some of my favorite bits. Hello. Hello. Thank you for coming and speaking. 
with us today. Um, I was curious, who do you look up to in life? Like, what are so, who are some of your heroes, people that inspire you, and why? Wow. Well, I, I'm a huge, um, as I mentioned right at the start, a huge consumer of uh, books, and I, I just love reading. So, so many examples to mention. Um, Richard Branson, I think, is brilliant. I love the way he just adds a playfulness to business. And he bought an island, <laughs> and it worked out pretty, <laughs> worked out pretty well for him. Um, and he just, he just looks like he's having fun, and business should be. You know, the business shouldn't be this wearing suits and gray and boring. Um, it's fascinating. You know, you get to meet incredible people. You get to travel the world. You get to speak at events like this. Uh, you get to kind of come up with ideas bubbling around your head and put them out in the world. So yeah, he, he's a huge um, hero in his book. I think his first book, Losing My Virginity, is really good. Uh, more contemporary, I love um, Bob Iger, uh, the CEO of Disney. His new book um, is fantastic and talks about his entire career and uh, how he bought Pixar and Lucas and, and um, Marvel. Uh, and he's just such a great leader, you know, very strong ethics. And so I think those are, are two, uh, two examples. I could name hundreds, but yeah, those are, those are two. Hi, thank you so much for coming here. Uh, my question is, do you see calm expanding into physical fitness and nutrition in the future? And how does the timeline look like? Yeah, um, thank you for saying thank you. You're all so polite. This is brilliant. Never had this before. Uh, <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, so potentially, potentially, we, we think there's a massive opportunity just focusing on the, the brain. And again, to my point, you know, we don't want to spread ourselves too thin. So we're very deeply focused on mental fitness. And I, I think we can build a, a $10 billion plus business just playing in that arena. But as I mentioned, health and, and wellness is, is over $4 trillion. So could, as we get bigger, could we start <coughs> buying other companies? Could we expand into different areas? Because ultimately, meditation is not a silver bullet. It's entwined with other things. So sleeping well and meditating and moving your body, all these things are interconnected. So I think there's a very good chance we will, um, we will go into those other areas at the right time. Oh, sorry. Hey, um, <laughs> I was wondering in terms of uh, down here. <laughs> in terms of growing and expanding, um, are you guys considering at all going public or would you like to keep more control of the company and, and maintain private? Yeah, uh, I love running a private company. <laughs> Things definitely change when you go public. You get the spotlight put on you, a lot more scrutiny. You have to kind of operate from quarter to quarter, harder to make long-term multi-decade bets. Um, but I think when you're a very fast-growing company, when you've raised a lot of venture capital, the kind of pressure to go public builds as the company gets bigger and bigger and all your employees that are working incredibly hard to have equity in the business want liquidity at, at some point. So I think it will happen. I think it's more likely than selling uh, the business because we think this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Um, but we've still got a bit of work to do before we're, we're ready to go public, I think. We're watching very carefully what's going on at the moment. Casper's having a... a troubling time. I think they've, uh, um, yeah, their S1 was pulled apart. We work had uh, more than a troubling time, <laughs> blew up the whole business. Um, so you've got to, you've got to do it at the right time. And we don't even have a CFO uh, or a COO at the moment. So I think we've got to get those in place. <laughs> and we're still only 100 people. So um, yeah, a little way to go. So obviously, the endorsement of LeBron James was extremely expensive. And it's probably the first in this kind of mindfulness space. Um, can you mind talking about the criteria that uh, your team kind of decided on and any other, whether it was athletes or influencers that you thought you, uh, your team would endorse other than LeBron James? Yeah, so we were very inspired by what Nike did on their journey. Um, Phil Knight's book, Shoe Dog, is, is fantastic. I'm sure lots of you have read it. But they used um, sports stars on their journey to help amplify their message. And we think this is going to be a very powerful way to amplify our message of, of mental fitness. If LeBron James or Lady Gaga or, you know, a, a politician, Michelle Obama, um, is talking about this and saying it's valuable, people listen. And that is a further accelerant moving away from where meditation and mindfulness was. So it's a very important part of our strategy. We love LeBron James because, you know, he has such a huge audience, 60 million plus Instagram followers. Um, people really respect him. He's a great ambassador. Um, and the way we think about these deals is, is uh, with the acronym ICE. We don't want to just go to a celebrity, write a big check, and say, 
you know, I use calm. Um, fast food companies, car companies do that, and it, it doesn't have the same authenticity. So this ICE acronym we think of is I. We love the people we work with to actually invest in the business. And we've made this public, but LeBron invested in Calm, which is a great um, sign of commitment. He uses it every day uh, to go to sleep. C is um, uh, content. So we want the celebrity to create content that lives in the app, which is really valuable for our users. And the E is engagement. We want them to actually use it and care about it and get value from it. And when those three things come together, uh, I think that's when really special things happen. So LeBron talks about calm. It's not in the contract, but he mentions it all the time. Matthew McConaughey does it. So if any of you, for your businesses, are going to use celebrities, I think that lens is, is a good one to, to look through it. Last two. Oh, Last two. One, one, one pair. Very we'll patient we'll down be, here. We'll better be a good one. <laughs> no, no pressure. Hi, Michael. Hello. So I'm wondering, um, was the growth of the app a linear progression? And if not, um, what were the pivotal moments or changes that unlocked the momentum for the product? And then what did you do? How did you deal with the stagnation in between those periods? Yeah, definitely not linear. Uh, as I mentioned, we've had a few tipping point moments, real inflections. I think most businesses will go through those. Uh, so number one was um, the launch of Daily Calm helping make meditation a habit for people because it was something new and something interesting every single day. Uh, inflection point number two was launching sleep stories, uh, which helped people fall asleep at night and they could throw away their sleeping pills and they shared about it via word of mouth. And um, so yeah, those were two big points. And, and what we do before we got to those, you know, there's this, this phrase of, um, uh, in entrepreneurship called the trough of disillusionment, and you guys may have, may have heard about it, but you, uh, you build a product, you launch it, and then nothing happens, and, <laughs> and you have this huge trough, and that's when the real kind of work needs to be done. And if you've got that massive North Star, if you really believe in what you're doing, you can cope with any matter of, of short-term problems and, and missteps and, and whatnot. So I think that's why, going back to that point of why are you working on this business? What is the ultimate end game? Um, not what you're focused on at that specific moment. Hey, Michael. Um, love your talk. Love the way you think about Calm as kind of a neurofitness um, thing. Um, I love neuroscience and the idea that you can improve your brain through um, repetitive actions. I'm wondering how you integrate neuroscience into Calm. Yes, so we have a, um, a scientific advisory board and at calm.com forward slash science, uh, we've published um, uh, several papers showing the link between calm and various uh, different positive health outcomes. Um, and so, yeah, we too are huge believers in kind of neuroplasticity and the idea that the human brain is not fixed and, and we can develop it, we can, we can train it, we can tweak it, we can mold it just as we can shape our physical bodies. So I think that's a, a really important kind of tenant uh, baked into uh, the business and, and how we work. Um, and if, if people have questions and, and there's things we didn't get to, I'm Acton on Twitter, uh, A-C-T-O-N, feel free to hit me up there, and Michael Acton on, on Instagram. So, um, yeah, if any of you guys want to uh, connect and follow the calm journey, yeah, don't get a few. Please, please feel free. <laughs> Thank I wanna, you. I wanna, oh, yes, go ahead. Two points. One, just because you wear a gray suit does not mean you're boring. Oh, um, I'm sorry. joking. When I, when, I, when I had my own company, I never, I never wore a suit. I never wore a suit when I worked. Are you kidding me? I was in environmental drilling. Oh, wow. I mean, it's the, the dirtiest business there is. Um, and then uh, just really to thank you, there's so many things five years from now. What are you going to remember from Michael's? Oh, also, for internships, jobs, do you have someone here they should contact? You've got this great talent. If there's anyone at your company that they should look or anywhere they should look, is there a place on the website? Uh, we have a careers page. Um, I think. Uh, yeah, if you just um, search Calm Careers and got videos and stuff about what we're doing. We've never launched an official intern project. Um, I think it's probably about time that we do. So, um, yeah, if you really are interested, I'm sure you'll find a way online of, of reaching me or, or some of the other folks in the business. So, um, 
you got a lot of people interested in this space. How many people really like this space, mental health, wellness? I do too, I love it. That's why we're, we're building this uh, Performance Science Institute to teach and research the science and applied processes of high performance mindset and wellness. So we've got you know NFL coach <coughs> Pete Carroll and Brene Brown and Angela Duckworth and Kobe was all, also part of it. So we, we got this momentum and it seems like a natural fit and that's what this class is about. So I'd, r I'd much rather have them learn these tools and science and what works when they're 20 than when they're 50. Uh -huh. It's just such That's a better way to live. Changing. It's a better way to live. All right. Help me thank Michael Acton Smith. <laughs> <laughs>